Professor Nan Goodman is a professor um, in the English Department of the University of Colorado at uh, Boulder. She has been visiting professor of law and humanities at Georgetown Law School and at uh, the University of Istanbul. She is the author of Banished, Common Law and the Rhetoric of Social Exclusion in, the, in Early New England and Shifting the Blame, Literature, Law and the Theory of Accidents in 19th Century America. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doreen. Um, and thank you to, uh, to a heartfelt thank you to the organizers, to Anat, uh, Roy, Chris, and Asaf um, for, uh, for inviting me here. It's really been a wonderful day so far, and I'm looking forward to the rest. Um, so uh, I'm, my, my, what I'm now going to say, I think, is um, is uh, been influenced by the panel that we that, that just uh, just occurred. Um, that's and that's uh, either a blessing or a curse. It tends to be how my how my mind works. It, whatever whatever critical work I've just read is uh, is typically um, what uh, what forms my um, my next thought. So um, the the the, uh, the paper that I wrote. Um, uh, Argues, in essence, that um, the tr the trial of Anne Hutchinson has been uh, misunderstood by scholars, uh, Puritanists, and others who have talked about her trial. It's a it's a much talked about uh, trial. The transcript itself is um, is fascinating, uh, and it's read as I try to indicate in the paper. It's read as a as a kind of um, a disaster for Hutchinson herself, who um, appears to be uh, winning the case, uh, making her point better than anyone else in the in the room for most of her trial, and then ultimately uh, and inexplicably uh, surrenders her her winning uh, position by claiming, at the end of this completely secular trial, that she's uh, she's experienced a revelation. And um, people, scholars of the trial, have argued that uh, she does that. This this happens for a variety of reasons. Some of them are absolutely ridiculous. Um, I think it's Emery Battis who argues that uh, that she was menopausal, and uh, and that's the reason that she um, that that she uh, that she finally admitted this. So who knows? Um, but my my uh, I, I take I take her revelation. Um, her admission of revelation seriously, and I try to read back uh, from that moment um, into the rest of the trial to to argue that, in fact, the revelation is uh, not unexpected, uh, not an unexpected moment at all, but that it's rather representative of the legal strategy that she uses throughout the trial, which is uh, to say that she she insists at every point. Uh, even even as she uh, defeats her interlocutors, her her accusers, um, in fact, on the orality that is the a u r a l i t y uh, of of uh, what it means to to make a legal claim, right? That the law, in fact, is about hearing uh, what people are saying, as opposed to uh, to arguing from some sort of uh, written text. And if only, um, if only her interlocutors, her accusers, would, would get that, uh, they would understand what she means at the end as well. So uh, that is to say that she's heard, she's heard, uh, she's talked to God, she's heard God. And actually the difference is, is, is important. She's heard God. Uh, she doesn't, she doesn't have, carry on a conversation with him. <laughs> um, so what are the implications of this, of this argument? Uh, I, th I think there are two major implications of the argument. One is that it's a rereading of the antinomian crisis itself. Uh, so for those of you who are not completely steeped in, um, in Puritan thought, which takes us, uh, I know that's just one or two of you, the most rest of you probably know it, know it all, but um, it takes us far afield from, uh, from, from where we've been so far in the conference. Um, I'll, I'll give a very, very brief praise. I'm sure, I'm sure, in fact, uh, all kidding aside, that it will be somewhat familiar. So, um, uh, only six years after the the Puritans in Massachusetts Bay arrived, they experienced 
what is traditionally known as this huge uh, crisis, right? The antinomian, called the antinomian crisis, um, in which uh, several prominent members of the community uh, went around, basically Hutchinson preeminent among them, went around uh, saying that the ministers who were preaching in the, in the colony were uh, not preaching a covenant of grace as they should have been, but were in fact preaching a covenant of works, right? And uh, from what I know about uh, the Puritans, this was true. <laughs> it just was true. Uh, there was no way for there's no there's no way of course to uh, incentivize a community uh, based simply on the doctrine of grace right that is to say the doctrine that suggests that you are predestined from birth uh, and and importantly crucially you there's no way for you to know whether you are uh, have have been given this grace or not right so so i mean the you know the, the way i teach this to the undergraduates is just, is is with the following example right there's how would you possibly prevent people from robbing 711s all day long if uh, there was no way to know that you were already uh, among the saved you could rob 711s as much as you wanted to and you would still be among the saved and go go to heaven so uh, the, the Puritans, from the very start, realized that they had a problem on their hands. Uh, they were starting from scratch, and uh, they did, in fact, preach a doctrine of works. That is, again, uh, to say, to clarify, that uh, that if you if you if you did good things, if you demonstrated uh, some evidence of virtue, you would be uh, more likely. To be among the saved, right? So, and 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 they were they were um, they were the recipients of a tremendous amount of uh, of of um, criticism for this, primarily from uh, the the Presbyterians uh, and others who th saw them as being completely hypocritical in this regard. They fudged it. They fudged the argument. They said again, you know, it wasn't it wasn't so much that if you did good things, you would definitely get there. You would get definitely be saved. But, you know, again, this sort of, this presumption, if I can use language from the morning sessions, this presumption was that if you manifested uh, virtue in terms of good works, you, it's almost certainly the case that you would be among the saved. Hutchinson, for Hutchinson, and for most Puritans, for all Puritans in New England, this was anathema. Um, so, so they didn't like that Hutchinson was doing this, and uh, Hutchinson opened her doors to, uh, to, at first, just a handful of people. Um, she lived in the largest house in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and uh, she opened her doors, and her house was, by the way, positioned right across from Governor Winthrop's, so he knew everyone who was going in and out of her house. And she opened her doors to first just a handful of people, and then, of course, more people came, and um, people really liked to hear what she had to say. And, uh, and when she was, um, she was tried twice. She was tried in this secular trial, which is the subject uh, of my paper, and then she was tried again by the church court, uh, in which she was excommunicated. So, um, so, so my, my, argument, uh, my argument is based on, on this controversy, and so the way in which it rereads re the antinomian controversy is to say that uh, there was, th that, her, that Hutchinson, who was one of the, the, the uh, leaders of this group, although not alone, was in fact uh, reading the law, the, the civil law, the secular law, um, which was in fact the common law of England, uh, in the same way that she was reading uh, the divine law. Um, that, that what she wanted was, uh, that, that the way she went about the world, right, that the way she experienced things phenomenologically was by hearing them. And so it was. It was as. It was as. Uh, it made just as much sense to say that she heard God, as to say that she, uh, that she didn't hear Winthrop, <laughs> um, in in the court. Right. That she's waiting for something that looked like, an auditory revelation from everyone she encountered. So that's the that's that's the the argument I make, um, about the the secular law. Right. And what she says in the in the. Uh, proceedings is that the that hearing god doesn't give her a message doesn't allow her to proclaim something that she doesn't become prophetic as a result of her revelation but very much on the order of her, the secular law that uh, she learns how to distinguish 
between what people say at different times and in different places. So to use some of the vocabulary from the from um, Le Le Levi's session, I would say that it is that orality in her case is site specific. Um, that she uh, that that she, what what she wants the court to recognize is that the common law, at least in her understanding, is a law that is uh, site specific. That it listens to people or should listen to people as they speak right there and then. So orality for her has an immediacy, a presence that, uh, that Winthrop seems to ignore and it has a, um, it has a, uh, uh, an evanescence as well. That, uh, that, that gives it its, its sort of site specificity that Winthrop also seems to ignore. Um, uh, also, I've, the, the, other, the other thing that, I, that, I, that sort of helped me clarify some of this as I was listening to the uh, earlier session is that uh, for Hutchinson there is a sense, this is something that Joseph David said, that the oral law um, is a law that is not just simply not the written law, it is a law that cannot, that cannot be written, right? That there are things that Hutchinson wants to hear that, uh, that are completely incommensurate with what it was that she, that she was said to have said in other circumstances and or to have written. Um, so that's, that's very important for her. Uh, and the, the second implication, so rereading the antinomian crisis, the second implication is just kind of a variation on that theme, but just a more general sort of um, version of it. And that is uh, that, is that, uh, that they con there's a continuum, a uh, constant continuum between the secular law and the religious law in, in this period, uh, in the early modern period. Uh, in general and more specifically in, in the context of the Puritan's understanding of it. Um, so, uh, and that's, that's a, it's a radical, it's a radical rereading of what the Puritans were all about. Um, uh, and uh, certainly a radical rereading of what Hutchinson was all about, right? Um, So I think I, you know, I'm I'm choosing to be very brief because I really want to hear what other people have said. Let me also just say that um, this is a really this was kind of a a new idea for me, and I'm really hoping um, uh, that that Khaled will uh, and others will help me out with the sound scholarship. Uh, I guess pun intended, the sound scholarship <laughs> uh, um, on, on this issue because, uh, because I'd really like to know more. And I'm hoping to, uh, to, to, to expand this so that I can uh, make a clearer argument about what it is that Hutchinson is, is after in, uh, in the trial. But what this is clearly is a close reading of how she moves through, how she sort of deflects uh, Winthrop's uh, accusations and moves through the trial uh, as if it were all all on a continuum with her ultimate disruption at the end, uh, the ultimate rupture, at so-called ostensible rupture at the end, which is when she says that she's she's actually uh, heard God. So even in the details of when she says she's heard God, uh, she never claims that she has some wacky, you know, weird. Uh, 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 heretical understanding of uh, what God is saying. She merely says she has learned from God how to hear things uh, in a different way than, than others have. So I think there's, I mean, I, what I try to do is, is draw out um, ways in which early moderns, not Hutchinson alone, but the early modern, modern people in general had a much more sort of, a much more profoundly oral understanding uh, of the law than, than we do. And I think much of that has been lost. So one of the difficulties I had was in trying to, to regain that, that sense. Uh, and if, if people can help with that, I'd also be very grateful. So 